Order, order. The next debate is regarding the Chagos Islands. I call Dr. Paul Monaghan to move the motion. Mr. Rosendale, thank you uh, for the opportunity to consider today the many issues that confront the UK Government in respect of the Chagos Islands. It is, of course, my privilege to serve under your chairmanship as the Scottish National Party member for Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross, and as a member of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Chagos. It would be remiss of me today if I did not begin this debate by highlighting the presence of Chagossians, other interested parties and members from all political parties that have taken the time and trouble to be present here today. It is, I think, rare for a humble Westminster Hall debate to be quite so well attended. The interest in this debate reflects widespread concern for the people of the Chagos Islands and a very high level of interest across the world. Many here today have worked tirelessly to highlight the injustices perpetrated upon the indigenous people of the Chagos Islands over many years by a nation state that should quite bluntly know better. On the 8th of November 1965, almost 50 years ago to the day, Harold Wilson, then Prime Minister, authorised the creation of the British Indian Ocean Territory. This act was far from benign. The establishment of this territory, as we shall see, was nothing less than a cynical and calculated plan to annex the Chagos Archipelago, expel its indigenous people, and then deploy their resources for military advantage. It was a plan that hinged on shameless exploitation. Over a five-year period, 1968 to 1973, every single Chagossian, man, woman and child, was forcibly removed in secret from their islands and none has since been allowed to return. For the last 50 years, Chagossians have lived in poverty and to the utter shame of every UK government and 17 foreign secretaries since, this ethnic cleansing of an entire people has been variously ignored, glossed over or actively misrepresented. The purpose of this annexation was to facilitate a lease the leasing of the largest island in the Chagos Archipelago, Diego Garcia, to the United States to allow the construction of an enormous military base. The base remains today. We now know that in return for annexing the Chagos Archipelago and expelling its people, the UK government received a cash discount of £11 million on Polaris nuclear missiles. That's equivalent to approximately £200 million today when adjusted for inflation. The story of Chagos is then a chronicle of abuse, naked greed and bullying on a grand scale. Indeed, it is a narrative of the hideous abuse of power and trust perpetrated against a humble people and an account of the success of a plan that hinged on the reprehensible neglect of a people's inalienable human rights. Many believe this abuse of power falls within the International Criminal Court's definition of a crime against humanity. That may be so, but what we can be certain of is the fact that human rights were sacrificed by the UK Government in a sordid deal to secure weapons of mass destruction. I am sure the Minister will agree this is an appalling legacy. Prior to 1968, Over 2,000 people lived on the Chagos Islands, many with family histories dating back almost 200 years. Chagossians had a thriving society with numerous villages, schools, hospitals, church, businesses and a unique way of life. Unknown to this parliament and in clear breach of United Nations charters, the UK government plotted to deliberately destroy that society. The truth about the cleansing of the Chagossians and the Whitehall conspiracy to deny there had ever been an indigenous population did not emerge for almost 20 years, until files were unearthed at the Public Records Office in Kew by the historian Mark Curtis, 
the journalist John Pilger and lawyers acting for the former inhabitants of the islands who were campaigning for a return to their homeland. Indeed. Thank you, Mr Rossendale. I'm not familiar with the geography of Diego Garcia, but is there enough room on the island for there to be a military base and the people to return? The geography of the islands it is an archipelago. There are hundreds of islands. There is more than enough space for everybody. In 1982, when the truth leaked out, the islanders exiled to Mauritius were awarded derisory compensation of less than £3,000 per person. Those exiled to Seychelles were awarded no compensation. It was noted then it, how it had been, quote, entirely improper, unethical, dictatorial to have the Chagossian put their thumbprint on an English legal drafted document where the Chagossian, who doesn't read, know or speak any English, let alone any legal English, is made to renounce basically all his human rights as a human being. Was this annexation improper? Certainly. Unethical? I have no doubt. Dictatorial? Absolutely. These are strong words, Mr Rosendell, but this is exactly how the UK Government has treated the people of Chagos and continues to treat the people of Chagos. And this is exactly the consideration the Minister is here today to explain. Today, I understand Diego Garcia remains the United States' largest military base outside of North America. There are two runways, over 30 warships, more than 4,000 troops, and a satellite spy station located on Diego Garcia. The base has been used as a launch pad for invasions, including that of both Afghanistan and Iraq. It is still used today and its use is still encouraged by the UK Government today. In 1966, terms for the lease of Diego Garcia were agreed at one US dollar per year. On expulsion, the indigenous population were allowed to take just one suitcase each. They were for forced into the hold of the SS Nordvar and transported to the Seychelles, where they were held in prison cells before being transited <coughs> elsewhere, many to Mauritius. Wherever they were sent, they were left without financial support. A Foreign Office memo on this subject at the time between Sir Paul Gore Booth to diplomat Dennis Greenhill stated, we must surely be very tough about this. The object of this exercise was to get some rocks which will remain ours. There will be no indigenous population except seagulls. The United States government will require the removal of the entire population of the atoll. Dennis Greenhill replied in August 1966, stating, Unfortunately, along with the birds go some few Tarzans and or Men Fridays whose origins are obscure and who are hopefully being wished on to Mauritius, etc. When this has been done, I agree we must be very tough and a submission is being done accordingly. It is impossible for the UK government to hide behind this correspondence. The casual disregard for human life evidences is chillingly calculated, unambiguous and staggering. Nevertheless, this tough action provoked legal action that has ultimately led to all of us visiting this place today. Of course. Will the Honourable Friend agree with me? It's, it's been previously estimated in 2007 that the litigation cost to the UK taxpayer against the Chagosians has mounted to over £4 million, which has no doubt increased after more recent legal proceedings. Does my Honourable Friend agree that this is hypocritical of UK governments to spend money in such a way, despite many of the Chagosians being denied fair compensation from the UK? Uh, my Thank you. My honourable friend raises a valid point which I will come to shortly. In 1975, a former resident of the Chagos Archipelago, Mr Michael Venkatasan, initiated a claim for compensation in the courts of England against the UK Government. 
The claim was settled in 1982 in an agreement in which the United Kingdom would pay £4 million into a fund for the former residents of the archipelago. This sum of £4 million was later held, together with a previous payment of £650,000 made to the government of Mauritius in 1966, as, quote, full and final settlement of all claims arising from the removal or resettlement of the population of the Chagos archipelago. This was despite the fact that many Chagossians have received no compensation at all. Other verdicts in English courts went in favour of the Chagossians in 2000, 2006 and 2007, until the House of Lords overturned them all and ruled in 2008 in favour of the UK Government. This bizarre ruling argued that the Chagossians were deprived of their right of abode lawfully. The ruling resulted in formation of the all-party parliamentary group on the Chagos Islands that has since met over 50 times and attracted members of every single political party represented here at Westminster. You will know, Mr Rosendale, that full cross-party representation on such a group is very rare indeed. Undaunted by the 2008 ruling, a group of Chagossians continued to pursue their claims before the European Court of Human Rights. In December 2012, the European Court held in Chagos Elders versus the United Kingdom that the claim was admissible on the grounds that, in settling their claims previously in 1982, as already noted, and in accepting and receiving compensation, the applicants had effectively renounced further use of legal remedies. Following the ruling, the Right Honourable Dominic Grieve, QCMP, said, quote, we, that is the UK Government, regret very much the circumstances in which they were removed from the islands and recognise that what was done then should not have happened. These are fine words on a flawed judgment because, I will note again, not all Chagossians were compensated. Five weeks before the general election in 2010, in parallel to the deprivation of right of abode actions, the Foreign Secretary at the time, David Miliband, who, it is worth noting, is now President and Chief Executive Officer of the International Rescue Committee, where he oversees humanitarian relief, ignored the advice of diplomats and rushed through the establishment of a marine protected area around the UK-controlled Chagos Islands. This was another significant, desperate and cynical attempt to anticipate legal claims on right of abode and to continue subverting the human rights of the Chagos people. At The Hague on the 18th of March 2015, the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruled in favour of Mauritius against the UK Government in respect of the Chagos Marine Protected Area arbitration case. The arbitration concerned a declaration by David Miliband as Foreign Secretary on the behalf of the UK Government on the 1st of April 2010 of a marine protected area in the waters surrounding the Chagos archipelago. The tribunal found that the consultations that took place in respect of the marine protected area were characterised by a lack of information and an absence of sufficiently reasoned exchanges between the parties involved. The tribunal noted in particular that the UK Government engaged far less with Mauritius in terms of establishing the protected area than it did with the United States. We need not speculate why. More recently, on the 4th of August 2015, the UK Government announced a three-month consultation exercise on purported resettlement of Mauritians of Chagossian origin in the Chagos archipelago. This consultation period ended yesterday. And yesterday, Mr Pierre Prosper, chairman of the Chagossians Committee in Seychelles, told me that while all Chagossians have responded to the consultation, stating that they want to return, all have refused the terms offered by the UK Government, which, quote, reduces us to cheap labour for the military base with no rights at all. Considering this consultation on resettlement specifically, the Minister should know that the proposed conditions of resettlement amount yet again to a gross violation of the Chagossians' most basic human rights. 
The Prime Minister of Mauritius has also rejected the premise of the UK Government's <coughs> consultation and has demanded that Chagossians who wish to resettle on the archipelago should be able to live in dignity, able to enjoy their basic human rights. I support this view, as does the Prime Minister of Mauritius, who earlier this month the United Nations General Assembly stated, quote, the Chagos Archipelago was illegally excised by the United Kingdom from the territory of Mauritius prior to its accession to independence, in breach of international law and resolutions of this Assembly. In the wake of this legal excisation, the Mauritians, who were residing at the time in the Chagos Archipelago, were forcibly evicted by the British authorities from the archipelago in total disregard of human rights. Most of them were moved to the main island of Mauritius. The government of Mauritius is fully sensitive to their plight and to their legitimate aspiration as Mauritian citizens to resettle on the archipelago. Mauritius welcomes the award of the arbitral tribunal delivered on the 18th of March 2015 against the United Kingdom under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We welcome the Tribunal's decision that the marine protected area purportedly declared by the United Kingdom around the Chagos Archipelago was established in violation of international law. That is an excellent summary of the current situation. The current resettlement proposals offer no right of abode and stipulate that Chagossians must return to their islands as, quote, contract workers with no right to buy land or property. Moreover, the resettlement is intended to be for a trial period, beginning with a two-year pilot after which resettlement may be cancelled. During this pilot period, Chagossians will not be allowed visitors on their island, despite hundreds of wealthy tourists visiting the islands each year, mooring their yachts, living in Chagossians' abandoned homes, and spending their time on the islands largely unmonitored. Similarly, unlike Tristan de Cunha and Pitcairn, the UK government's resettlement proposals advise that no education services will be provided, thereby effectively excluding families with children from returning to their islands. In short, the consultation and the terms of resettlement are transparent and satisfactory and quite obviously designed to scare the indigenous people and ensure the resettlement of the Chagos Islands fails. The refusal of the consultation document to guarantee support for Chagossians if resettlement is cancelled after two years means Chagossians face an unenviable dilemma and an unattractive and very insecure future. Furthermore, many Chagossian groups in Europe, for example Switzerland and France, have not been consulted on the resettlement proposals at all. The conclusion, sorry, the consultation as an exercise in engagement is then effectively worthless and should be viewed and condemned as such. To be clear, the UK Government's consultation fails spectacularly to address the key issues and should be roundly dismissed. It is, of course, welcome that the UK Government is considering how to make Chagossian resettlement a reality, but the terms of resettlement must be fair to Chagossians. The current proposals are not. Finally, I want to return to the cost of resettlement and to highlight that the basic premise advanced by the UK Government of there being, quote, uncertainty over both resettlement costs and demand is simply inaccurate. Indeed, recent Freedom of Information requests reveal that KPMG, who evaluated resettlement options and developed the costings, have described their own estimates as having been made, quote, with pessimism. It remains unclear who instructed that pessimism, but I'm sure at some point we will find out. To put this pessimism in context, one estimate suggests, quote, capital and training costs of £267.5 million over six years to resettle 1,500 people. Another scenario is costed at £4.04 million per person to meet the capital costs of, quote, resettlement and security over the first 10 years. There is, in fact, no consistency 
and no credible explanation for the overly high cost estimates of resettlement included in the UK Government's consultation document. Yeah. And I thank the Honourable Gentleman for Kate Ness Sutherland and Ross for giving way a second time. You mentioned the figure of 1,500 Chagossians to return. It was roughly that number that were dispossessed in the first place. I would have thought the number would be more now with everything happening with families. Is it still 1,500? It's not 1,500. I think the, the number now uh, of uh, Chagossians and their dependents is approaching 5,000. But the consultation document produced by the UK Government suggests that 1,500 people might be resettled in one of the scenarios that they've put forward. As I was saying, Mr uh, Chairman, there is in fact no consistency and no credible explanation for the overly high costs of resettlement included in the consultation document. But perhaps the Minister will take the opportunity today to highlight and explain the pessimism that is included in the figures. KPMG's pessimistic estimates suggest resettlement could start at £64 million over three years, which represents a tiny percentage of the Department for International Development's budget. £64 million is certainly far less than the comparative £200 million cash discount achieved by the UK Government on the leasing of Polaris nuclear missiles in 1966. Indeed, £64 million seems a bargain by comparison. Well, do the Honourable Member give way? Indeed. Thank, Thank the Honourable Member for giving way. Um, clearly, the report actually said that there was no fundamental reason why the Chagasian people should not return to the Chagos Islands. Should, do you not think that, does the member not think that at this time that the injustice that was given to those people, that no money, any money, it, that should not be the reason for not giving people the right to return. Money should not be an issue in this case. Before uh, the member rises again, could I just point out we only have between 15 and 20 minutes for the room six backbenchers who'd like to contribute to this debate. So maybe the honourable member may consider that in his remarks. Thank you. Um, this is clearly a complicated debate and an important one for lots of people who are in this room today. I absolutely agree with the honourable member. Uh, this is not a debate about money. It shouldn't be a debate about money. There are uh, moral imperatives uh, attached to the resettlement of the Chagos Islanders. Now, as the UK-US agreement on the use of Diego Garcia approaches expiration on the 30th of December 2016, the UK government finds itself in an opportune point, at an opportune point to renegotiate the terms of lease for a further 20 years. The relationship began with the UK government abrogating its responsibilities, accepting a discount on Polaris nuclear weapons and implementing a programme of forced expulsion of the Chagossian people. It should end on 21st century humanitarian terms. I ask the Minister today to ensure that the United States support the resettlement of the Chagos Islands as a prerequisite for extension of the current agreement. I suggest today that if the United States had fundamental concerns about sharing Diego Garcia with Chagossians, they would not have allowed resettlement to be considered in the first place. But perhaps the Minister will confirm today that Mr Simmons' statement from 2013 remains the position of the UK Government and that resettlement can be made compatible with the security needs of the base, as indeed is the case with all other United States military bases around the world. Mr Simmons was, of course, the minister who made such a statement on the 19th of November 2013. If not, then I am sure the minister will want to take the opportunity today to explain what it is that differentiates the Chagos Islands and which requires the continued subversion of their human rights and the continuation of their marginalisation, because it is, frankly, absurd to claim that Chagossians are a serious security threat. But beyond all of this, there is a human moral imperative to resettlement. I have already noted that there are Chagossians here today, some of them 
want to return to live in their homeland to live out their lives. Some younger Chagossians want to live and work in the land of their parents and grandparents. All of them want to see their homeland grow and prosper again. And all of them want their right of abode reinstated. And in respect of that right of abode, the decision of the Supreme Court is awaited. Regardless of the Supreme Court's ruling in respect of the 2008 Majority Lords verdict, all right-minded people must continue to argue for the most fundamental and basic human rights to be restored to the Jagossian people. Mr Rosendell, I urge the Minister not to rise today at the end of this debate to recount yet another pitiable series of excuses as to why the UK Government should not cannot or will not act to reset all the Chagos Islands. Excuses, and we must be very clear on this point, are not acceptable. The UK Government's continuing human rights abuses perpetrated upon the Chagos Islanders are simply unacceptable. All of us in this room today know the truth about Chagos. We know what the islands are used for. We know who uses the islands. We know the ecology of the islands, and we know the ecology of the oceans surrounding the islands. We know the rainfall pattern of the islands, and we know that the islands are not dangerous, uninhabitable, or sinking. And we know the social history of the islands. We also know the true scale of the wrongs that have been perpetrated, Minister, and we know the true cost of resettlement. Rise today, Minister, and tell us, all of us here and those watching at home, what you are going to do now to right the wrongs inflicted upon this people. Rise today, Minister, to apologise to the Chagos Islanders and to explain to all of us what you and your government intend to do now to compensate Chagossians, particularly those in Seychelles. Explain how you will work to support the resettlement of all Chagossians, how you will reinstate the vibrant society they once maintained and which the UK government so casually destroyed and continues to deliberately and willfully subvert today. Minister, return to the Chagossians their human rights as codified in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, including their right of abode. Provide clarity on their citizenship status and their right to develop economic activity. Chagossians offer no threat to the operational activities of Diego Garcia, and I urge you to use the period in which the terms of the UK-US agreement on the use of Diego Garcia are being renewed to agree that both governments will support Chagossian people. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered the Chagos Islands. We only have uh, 12 minutes left for six backbench speeches, so can I ask members to keep their remarks as short as possible. I call Henry Smith. Uh, Mr Rosendell, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship once again, and I would like to congratulate the honourable member for Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross on securing what is a very important debate. Mr Rosendell, there are more Chagos Islanders here in this Grand Committee room than exist on the Chagos Archipelago, and that uh, is a great injustice uh, that is visible here uh, today. I first came across uh, the issue of the uh, Chagos uh, Islands uh, when I was a teenager reading a book about the remaining uh, British overseas territories and I was appalled then uh, that what happened under the Wilson administration in the late 1960s uh, was uh, the sort of appalling colonial abuse that uh, one uh, would have associated with 150 or even 200 years ago. Little did I know that later on I would have the honour and privilege to represent the largest Chagos Island community uh, anywhere uh, in the world in my constituency of Crawley. Uh, first of all, as leader of West Sussex County Council, where we were pleased to do what we could to support the community uh, arriving at Gatwick uh, and into this country. And latterly, over the last five and a half years, as Member of Parliament, uh, I have been pleased to be a member of the all-party parliamentary uh, group uh, and uh, to uh, advocate on behalf of the Chagos Islanders. Uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross has uh, set out uh, many of the arguments. I won't repeat them uh, because uh, of uh, the constriction that we have uh, on time. Uh, but what is important, I think, to state today, Mr Rosdell, is that we can't turn back the clock, but we can do the right thing now. 
Uh, the Honourable Member was mentioning how uh, people live next to air bases all around the world. It should be no different in uh, the Chagos Islands. And I commend uh, this government and the previous coalition government for at least starting the process of a consultation which of course finally ended yesterday evening and the anniversary of the creation of the British Indian Ocean Territory uh, being uh, in a couple of weeks uh, time. Uh, now is the moment uh, when uh, the government uh, I believe should further follow through uh, and agree to that resettlement. There are funds available, uh, European Union funds, uh, the international aid budget. Uh, we have um, one of the most generous international aid budgets uh, anywhere in the world. We should be using that for the benefit of these British citizens and their right of return uh, to the homeland. Briefly, uh, Mr. Rosendahl, I'd like to uh, mention the issues of those Chagos Islanders who uh, would prefer to stay uh, living in this country, although I absolutely accept and need to acknowledge that the majority uh, rightly wish to return uh, that, and I appreciate this is an issue for the Home Office, uh, there needs to be uh, further work done on passports and visa issues, uh, which is something many of my constituents grapple with. I would like to thank uh, members of the Chagos community in this country uh, for uh, the respectful way that they have fought uh, for their rights, given the appalling injustice uh, that has been done to them. On the issue of sovereignty, uh, I think I will probably disagree with the uh, Honourable uh, Member who called this debate. Uh, I believe the ideal solution is that the Chagos Islanders should be allowed to return to their homeland and then, just like every other overseas territory, it should be up to them to decide uh, under which sovereignty in the future they mm -hmm. wish to live. Uh, given the time, Mr Rosdell, I could say much more, but I would uh, uh, like to uh, encourage other members to uh, contribute as well. Thank you. Danny Kenyon. Thank you very much. I didn't actually come in um, to speak here, but I would fully agree with what has just been said. We have to find a middle ground, and that duty falls on us, Minister, to find a way where we can get them back to their homes and find a way that works with them there, living with schools, with their own religions and their home around the base. That's all I want to say, but thank you. Uh, Kate Hoey. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr Rossendale, and it's delightful to have you chairing this particular debate, uh, as I know you have been involved in the past. Um, I also want to pay tribute to all the members of, of the uh, all-party group who over a period of time have really tried to keep this issue in the spotlight, and particularly to my right honourable friend, the new leader of um, my party, who actually, yeah. through thick and thin, chaired the Chugesa, this group, the all-party group, mm -hmm. for many years and has done a huge amount to keep this. I know that he would have liked to have been here today, um, but um, I, I, I don't think he can be. I just want to add very briefly to say, to me, this is unbelievable that this could happen today, what we did to those people 50 years ago. Unbelievable. We would not have let it happen. And the fact that it did happen and the fact that so many years later they are still waiting for their human rights to be restored is, is shameful on all of us. Uh, it is the perfect time now to get this return fair package 50 years on, particularly when the negotiations are coming up with the United States next year. We just have to be absolutely firm. This will not be renegotiated unless we have a fair return for all, all the islanders. And I, I do feel that you know, the, the cost, as I've already said, and I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for raising this debate and outlining in such a clear way uh, the history of this, because anyone who reads the history cannot be other than moved by the injustice of what happened to those people. And we now have an opportunity, 50 years on, to really make it happen. Money should not be the issue. The money is there. And if, pe if the government was to work with the people themselves as to how they want this to happen, once we have made the decision that it's going to happen, which I hope now has been accepted with that um, report which said there was no reason whatsoever from the independent study that they could go back, then we have to make it happen as quickly as possible. But we have to work with the, the Chagosian people themselves to make it sure that when they go back, that they're going back under the terms that are ha they are happy with and that they're not going to be misled again and sign up to uh, all sorts of agreements which then afterwards prove 
not to be uh, able to be carried out. So I'm very, very supportive today of this happening. And I, I want to again pay tribute to all of them who've shown such dignity over many, many years in this dreadful, dreadful thing that happened to them 50 years ago. Dr Tanya Mathias. Ms. Rossendale. And uh, may I also commend uh, the member for Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross for bringing this very important debate to our attention, the member from Crawley. I just wish to add very briefly that I consider this as a gross injustice, removing 1,500 people against their will, a gross injustice then to have an airbase with a very questionable history in this century on their land, a gross injustice for a marine protection area without consulting the people that should be there in their homeland. I didn't know about this when I was younger. I wish I had. I owe it to my constituent, Mr George Beckman, who brought this to my attention. And I'm honouring a promise I gave him as a candidate that I would stand up for Chagos Islanders you deserve your home, you deserve reparation and an apology. And I'm very, very privileged to be in the same room as you today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Alan Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Rosendale, and it's a, uh, a pleasure to serve on your chairmanship. As a member of the All Party Group, the Chagas Islands, I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate, but clearly it would be much better for everybody in this room concerned if there was no need for a debate to be taking place after all these years. Now, we heard from Ornwell Friend that the history of this starts in 1965-66, and it was 66 the agreement was made about the US naval base. That was before I was born, so I tried to think what, what drove the thinking at the time. You know, there was a Cold War. What, did people believe that their actions were justifiable at the time? But even trying to put myself back then, there's no way you can justify what happened. Clearing the people from their homeland and trying to cover it up and justify it as contract workers. But worse than that, we've had 50 years of effectively cover up and blocking it since then. And that's what's truly shocking, if you ask me. Um, I mean, a, a quick timeline flavour. 1971, the UK government issued an immigration ordinance create, um, prohibiting return to the islands. 1982, compensation was paid, whereby it was obviously hoped that, that would let the matter disappear, but the compensation was only paid to Mauritian Chagas and not uh, Chagas Islanders that uh, live in the Seychelles. It obviously forced the issue to go to the courts. Now, in two, the year 2000, the High Court ruled that the, the ordinance was illegal, which the UK government seemed to accept but then decided not to accept, which is another shameful outturn. In 2004, new orders were issued prohibiting the return, which of course forced the matter back through the courts. Now, 2006-2007, the Chagas Islanders won in the High Court and then the Appeal Court. But unfortunately, in 2008, the UK government took the fight to the, uh, the law lords and uh, got a, a decision favourable to them and a split decision. Now, for me, the year 2009 is actually really significant as well. Um, the European Court had suggested that a friendly out of court settlement could be pursued, but that wasn't taken up with the UK government. Um, at the same time, the UK government said they had a moral responsibility to the Chagas that will never go away. So the actual government said the moral responsibility will never go away, but at the same time, behind the scenes, they were working on plans to create a marine uh, protection area. So that was more uh, double, double uh, dealing, as it were. Um, and at the same time, 2009, the, the immigration bill was passed, and one of the consequences of the immigration bill, the UK government refused to accept an amendment that, that would um, allow special consideration for the Chagas Islanders, so their dependents are not entitled to British citizenship. So that, that's another strand, and it's actually real important now because it, people have been forcibly moved from their islands. Some of them have settled in the UK, but now they're getting told their UK de uh, descendants aren't entitled to British citizenship. Um, now, this year, March 2015, it was, it was ruled that uh, the Marine Protection Area violates international law. Unfortunately, we also discovered from WikiLeaks, of all things, that the MPA was, as was suspected, it was just a, a mechanism to, pro to prohibit the islanders returning. So, that, again, that's more shameful um, deceit in recent times by the UK government. So, 
My honourable member, I touched on the, the KPMG report. Now, at least, as was said, the recent governments have uh, undertaken a, a commission the feasibility study in terms of allowing islanders to return. But if you look at the costs that we heard were, um, were pessimistic, £23 million estimated for housing and public buildings for just 150 people, £10 million for housing for a pilot of 50. There is no doubt that these costs are designed to scare the government and give an excuse um, not to do it. So I will quickly conclude, and apologies for going on, but there are three key issues that the government needs to sort out now. That is resettlement and allowing a claim for resettlement, citizenship for dependents who now understandably maybe don't want to move back because they've now been displaced for that long and the, the future sovereignty of the islands and we really need to get this sorted and remedy the wrongs of the past 50 years. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr. Ross. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and uh, I know you take an interest in these matters. I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Keith and the Sutherland and Easter Ross for securing the debate, an issue to which he's been long committed and which is highly topical and I welcome the work of the APG and the various members who've spoken um, and I note that the honorary president of the APG, the member for, uh, I don't know whether he's honourable or right honourable yet, uh, for Islington North is, uh, is with us and welcome him to his place. It's a, a very commendable show of support and solidarity. In his maiden speech uh, in the chamber, my honourable friend uh, highlighted both the cause of the Chagossian people and the historical experience of people in his own constituency who were affected by the Highland clearances. And in my constituency, those clearances are commemorated, uh, in amongst other ways, by a plaque on the wall of the Leishmore Bar. And that plaque names some of those most responsible for the forced, remo for the forced removal of people and what it calls a form of ethnic cleansing. I'll leave it to members to visit my constituency to determine exactly where in the bar that plaque is located. But it is in a place where it invites male members to pay those it names uh, the respect it says that they are due. Now, whether exactly the same attitude should be applied to those responsible for the forced removal of the Chagossians is not necessarily for me to say. But what is clear is that the situation is an injustice for which a resolution is long overdue. This, very briefly. Very quickly, having had some experience of this, this looks like classic ethnic cleansing. Yes. And the Human Rights Commissioner of the United Nations should take more interest in this. I, I, I think Andrew that's a very, fair, a very fair point well made, and we'll maybe have the Minister's response to that. The Scottish National Party has for many years expressed its solidarities with the Chagossian people, and I take this opportunity to do so again today. At our Spring Conference in 2015, we agreed a resolution earlier this year, expressing frustration with the ongoing approach of the UK Government in relation to the Chagossian people and agreeing that the behaviour of the UK Government has consistently been contrary to well-established laws on decolonisation and self-determination. Now, These are admittedly complex areas of international law, but certainly the tradition in Scotland is that sovereignty should lie with the people. And so, irrespective of territorial claims of the United Kingdom, Mauritius or any other third party, the fundamental right to live and work on the Chagos Islands should lie with the people who live there until their forced removal at the hands of a UK government. So we can welcome what slow progress there might well have been, but the terms and conditions of the pilot resettlement proposal are minimalist to say the least, and I think my honourable friend has gone into that in some considerable detail and highlighted the views of the Chagossian community. So um, I hope that um, if the Chagossians or supportive organisations or anyone else comes forward with alternative suggestions or proposals, the Minister will listen to those. And the, 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 what's in the, the current consultation will not simply be presented as a fait accompli. I know the APG has suggestions about possible sources of funding for resettlement, and it's questioned the cost uh, of resettlement highlighted in the KPMG report. The highest cost I can find is something like £267 million over six years. And while that's not a small amount, I imagine it pales in comparison with the amounts have been spent in building, maintaining and running a US defence base. A defence base, of course, which uh, the government itself has admitted was used for rendition of prisoners, and that only compounds the injustice that has happened in that part of the world. Time is extremely short, so I, I can't go into all the detail that I wanted to, um, which I think shows that this debate does deserve time on the floor of the House once the government reaches, or before the government reaches a decision, so that the whole House can have its say. It raises a huge number of questions about wider issues around the sovereignty of people, the role 
role and uh, of current and former colonial powers questions of geopolitical and military industrial significance. If so-called com- developed countries can trample on the rights of small nations and communities out of military or political expediency, it makes it difficult for those same countries to then lecture or encourage so-called less developed countries to smarten up their act on questions of respect for human rights and the international rule of law. There are far too many historical and current examples of forced removal and migration of peoples and the impact this has on culture, economies, ways of life and indeed the environment. In the case of the Chagos Archipelago, there are clear paths to restoration. And if the government for the restoration and the chance to right an historic wrong, if the government can show some political will and make the kind of progress it's being called for, then not only will some justice have been done for the Chagossian people, but there will be hope for other communities in similar situations elsewhere. And if not, the only conclusion that can be reached is that attitudes that should have set with the sun at the end of the British Empire are still, in fact, stubbornly and unnecessarily at work at the heart of government today. Stephen Doherty. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr Rosendell. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I should uh, let the members of the the debate know that I've uh, just taken on this role uh, just this morning. Uh, But the uh, situation and the historical injustice done to the Chagos Islanders is a situation that I have been long familiar with. Um, And I am uh, going to defer to the expertise and passion that's in this room, not least from my right honourable friend, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, who was president of the group, and we've heard spoken about my my honourable friend for uh, Vauxhall. And I wanted to start by paying tribute to the Honourable Member for Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross uh, for what I thought was a very powerful and personal and thorough exposition of what is fundamentally the appalling treatment of a people. Um, I also wanted to mention the... Uh, I will give very briefly away. Does the Honourable Member believe, like me, it's a very timely situation? Because for 50 years, as Old Hallows approaches, the Shagoshians haven't been able to mourn the souls of their dead adequately because there's been no right of return. Well, my, my honourable friend makes an incredibly powerful point, and I think we're celebrating um, and we're noting many uh, historical dates in this history. This is sad, sadly a tragic celebration, and I think it's an, a very opposite time for this debate. Um, the honourable member for Crawley, I thought, also um, spoke passionately, obviously, in his constituents, um, the stark illustration of the injustice, um, and I certainly had very strong degree of sympathy with his views on, on sovereignty and that, that fundamental choice in the future must lay with Chagossians. Um, my honourable friend for Vauxhall, I think, also uh, made the very similar powerful point that uh, the people people must be at the very heart of decisions about uh, their future and the, the dignity that they have shown uh, throughout these, these long decades of, of struggle over this issue and, and commend many of the other comments that have been made. Uh, let me be clear, Mr Rosendell, um, I have absolute uh, and deep regret, which I know is shared by uh, the official opposition, over the way that the Chagossians were forcibly resettled in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And I certainly, for one, could not justify those actions, nor can I uh, excuse the conduct of a previous generation and pre- previous governments, whether those were Labour or, or otherwise. And in my view, there is a fundamental moral responsibility on the UK government towards the islanders, which is not going to go away. And I would certainly wish to urge the government to do all they can to seek a resolution. Um, now, uh, members um, attending the debate will know this is a view shared by MPs across the House, um, including the Leader of the Opposition. Um, and, and let's be frank, this is not the only episode of regrettable action and events in the turbulent process of decolonisation. Uh, members will be aware that I've long been a supporter of the cause of Somaliland, also a former uh, British colony. Um, but the difficult fact, of course, is that like that case, uh, we as successor generations often find ourselves less with very, very complex legal and practical conundrums involving other sovereign states states, international bodies and treaty obligations that can often conflict or at the very least appear to conflict. Um, And whatever the rights and wrongs of the original actions, the fact is that the base does exist on Diego Garcia and that there are agreements between the US and UK uh, based, as we know, on the 1966 exchange of notes. But I very, very fundamentally believe, uh, Mr Rosendahl, there must be a way of resolving that. And we've heard um, that that, that's a common view across uh, those who've contributed to the debate today and that the all-party group itself has said that any renewal of the 1966 agreement must be conditional on a commitment to facilitate and support Dragossian resettlement. And I also note that what the Honourable Member secured the debate said in response to the Honourable Member for Beckenham in that place, there is uh, the practical 
possibility of this happening, so why don't we just get to that? So I just have a series of brief questions for the Minister uh, before allowing him to reply, which I'm sure uh, we all want to hear from. Um, I wonder if he could um, sort of update us on the status of the negotiations with the United States on the renewal of the 1966 notes and, and any views on the US's uh, amenability to resettlement alongside any base remaining in the future. Secondly, I wonder what his reaction was to the very legitimate concerns raised by the Honourable Member who secured the debate about the current proposals for resettlement and whether those are practically adequate for the Chagos Islanders. And thirdly, um, given uh, the judgment of the UN Convention of Law and the Sea um, Tribunal on the uh, Maritime Protected Area on the 18th of March, I wanted to understand what is the position of the UK Government relating to that? Does it accept the judgment um, and how uh, does it intend to deal with that going forward? And lastly, um, we understand obviously that the Supreme Court heard um, very, very core arguments in June uh, regarding the 2008 decision and have at the moment reserved judgment. Um, I'm not a, a deep familiarity with the uh, proceedings of the Supreme Court, but does he have any update on when we might expect a decision? Um, because I think that is something that we would all uh, wish to uh, hear. But let me finish, Mr Rosendell, by saying my great sympathies with the, uh, the concerns of the Chagos Islanders. That's certainly the view of the official opposition. And, and we would wish to seek to work with the government to find whatever solution could be find, found to achieve the resolution of their desires and their hopes uh, for resettlement and to, re to right those historic wrongs. James Dutteridge. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendale, and it's great to serve under your chairmanship, particularly on the specific subject, which I know you show great interest uh, in. I think the fact that so many people have turned up to this debate shows the passion um, of views on the subject, and I wager that this is the first time a leader of opposition for a very long time, if ever, has turned up to a Westminster Hall uh, debate. And certainly I will be going to the House of Commons Library challenging them to disprove that as a hypothesis, but it is good to see uh, the leader of the opposition uh, here alongside a, a new opposite number uh, in the member for uh, Cardiff South and Panath. I look forward to working uh, closely on a number of issues. I congratulate the Honourable Member for Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross for securing this debate, uh, particularly getting it today in a very timely way uh, in relation to the consultation, building on uh, a passionate uh, view of the Chagos Islands, um, particularly reflecting on uh, the situation in the Highlands. I, I wasn't there for the Honourable Gentleman's maiden speech, but I have read it and it's very powerful echoing. Um, the uh, comments from the Honourable Member for Glasgow North about the parallels uh, with the problems. The all-party group historically uh, has been very, very active on these challenging issues and I'm grateful for uh, ongoing contributions and I know um, whilst uh, I, I've met with members of the group informally, uh, other Foreign Office colleagues in my absence have met formally uh, with the, the group um, and quite rightly so. Uh, in response, I'd like to focus um, on the resettlement of the islanders and talk about and recognise the very, very real problems of their removal in the late 60s and 70s. I'd like to begin by reassuring the House that I am considering this issue very importantly um, and plan to travel uh, to the islands and see for myself um, the situation, to probe some of the issues that are raised during the consultation, to overcome some of the issues that are in the uh, KPMG report, uh, and to uh, be as best informed I can be before recommending and taking decisions uh, on this subject. And I'm hoping to do that uh, very soon, because I'm uh, acutely aware that this is a long-standing process. I give way to the Leader of the Opposition. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Thank you Mr Rosendell. Firstly, I apologise for not being in for the earlier part of the debate, and I'm doing what I've condemned many others for doing, is turning up late and taking part. Please forgive me. I, I declare an interest as, a, as the President of the Chagos Islands Group, and I declare an interest as a passionate advocate for the Chago, Chagos Islanders for a very long time. I'm delighted that the Minister is travelling there, delighted that he's meeting the islanders. I hope that he will, and I'm sure he will, understand the humanitarian hurt that the Chagos Islanders have suffered, the justice of their right to return, and the real possibility that that could be brought about. I hope he will agree that as soon as he returns from that visit, he will meet the all-party group, have a serious discussion with them, and of course with the islanders themselves, so we can finally put to bed this horrible period in British history when a group of islanders, wholly innocent of anything, were so abominably treated, so brutally removed from their homes, and have suffered for so long and fought so valiantly for their human right to live where they were born and where they grew up. 
Uh, James Dutteridge. Thank you, Honourable Gentleman, for, for those uh, comments, and certainly we are happy to meet the all party group after, um, and if time allows, perhaps meet one or two uh, members of the group before, perhaps informally, just to uh, further uh, gain some understanding of the issues raised. Um, uh, move, move, moving forward, and, and there, were, there was a number of points made. I'll try to move swiftly and cover as many um, as I can. Um, this government, like successive ones uh, before it, has made clear of the regret of the wrongs to the Chagossian people over 40 years. I will not seek to justify in my short speech these actions or excuse the conduct of an earlier generation. Uh, what happened simply was wrong. Uh, in the words of uh, the Honourable Member uh, leading this debate, it's an appalling history. It was therefore right historically to pay substantial contribution, and both the British Courts and the European Courts of Human Rights have confirmed that that compensation uh, has been paid in full and final settlement. But quite rightly, we are here today in the, in the middle of a, a, another process. Decisions about the future of the British Indian Ocean Territories are difficult. I think uh, occasionally they're presented as uh, slightly more simplistic. Uh, whilst cost isn't the main issue, it is one of many issues and we should consider it. Successive governments have been opposed to the resettlement on the grounds of feasibility and on the grounds of defence. Um, the House will recognise that there are fundamental difficulties, but we should look to see how those could be overcome. Uh, in 2000, uh, the Labour government looked at the practical challenges of returning Chagossians to the territories permanently and concluded it would be both precarious and entail expensive underwriting for an open-ended period. However, under the previous Foreign Secretary, uh, previous member, uh, Right Honourable Member for Richmond in 2012, uh, the policy review was announced, uh, including the new study into a feasibility of resettlement that concluded in January uh, uh, of this year. Uh, the, uh, i.e. the KPMG report. Uh, that independent study uh, showed that resettlement could indeed be practically feasible, uh, but there were significant challenges that remain, um, and uh, hopefully some of those challenges will be picked up both in the consultation, uh, the work that ministers uh, have commissioned subsequently, and be picked up by myself in my visit and subsequent uh, meetings. In March 2015, ministers at Cabinet level uh, carefully considered the KPMG study, uh, which is bringing us to where uh, we are now. And we will continue to look at those issues uh, in detail. The consultation which ended yesterday uh, was uh, well received. Over 700 written responses have been received, and officials have met over 500 Chagossians in their own communities in the UK, Seychelles, uh, Mauritius, um, and places including Switzerland, France, and as far afield as Tasmania. Um, but it's important uh, that we consult as widely as possible. Whilst we know that uh, many do want to go back, um, the, it's important that in the independent feasibility study and more recently we recognise that some Chagossians are more interested in securing other forms of support in places that they live and we should look to see what we can do uh, for everyone, uh, not just those uh, that are returning. It is quite right that in the KPMG report it looked at uh, options that fall short of full resettlement uh, and if it turns out that that is something that we can't do, we shouldn't simply uh, do nothing. But there are other issues. It's not just a cost issue. There are financial issues, legal issues, social issues, and the ability to continue the military uh, facilities on Diego to Garcia to operate unhindered. And the US government have uh, expressed concerns about op operating alongside uh, a community, but I recognise points that have been made uh, very firmly here by strong uh, advocates, both advocates that have met uh, people on the doorstep, like the Honourable Lady for Twickenham, um, and uh, long-standing advocates like the member for Crawley, who has been bending my ear on this subject, I think probably from the day I was appointed, and will continue quite rightly uh, to do that uh, going uh, forward. Um, I, I won't give way, I've, I've, only, I've only got one and a half minutes, um, and I'm not, probably not going to manage to cover all points um, that were, were raised. Um, there was a number of issues around uh, the Supreme Court. I don't want to get into critiquing um, ongoing legal cases. Um, my understanding um, of the issue around UNCLOS uh, is slightly different to presented uh, to the House um, in that um, whilst the UN Convention on Law Overseas 
uh, found for us on Sovereignty, i.e. the UK Government. Um, it was only um, on, on the uh, process of the consultation um, that they said Mauritius um, the consultation with Mauritius wasn't sufficient. Um, I would again encourage the Mauritian government uh, to engage on resettlement discussions uh, with us, but to, to date they've uh, unfortunately uh, refused to do that. That would be uh, incredibly helpful uh, going forward. I take my responsibilities as Minister in this regard uh, very seriously, which is why I'm allocating a lot of time to it. I will continue to do so. Um, I've read every single word of the KPMG report. I will do so again on what I understand will be a very long journey, uh, both out to the, the islands. If time allows uh, and uh, I'm able to get away, I will also try to get to the outer islands because I think that's an important element as well, um, so I can look at all of the, 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 the options uh, before uh, taking recommendations uh, to more senior ministers and the government coming to a decision. Uh, in conclusion, it's an important issue, and I thank the honourable member sincerely and everyone for their time on this debate. The question is that this House has considered the Chagos Islands. As many of the opinions say aye. aye. It's the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Order, order.